away from the position that we took in the High Court. My Lord and my Lady, I wanted to just point out that quite uh, uh, perhaps uh, number one and more import uh, very importantly for us, that issue is one of the uh, grounds of appeal that we have. The issue of the mischaracterization of continuous registration of voters and you heard Dr. Biancolu say that uh, uh, we, we, we talked about revision of the register. My lords and my ladies, the issue that then we need to make clear in the main ground of appeal is the mischaracterization of the, uh, the, the use of the word revised and continuous registration of voters. So kindly, my lords and my ladies, have that in mind because it is an important issue that arises from a misreading of those two statutes. Most of that. All right. I hope we can now continue. Uh, we have spent about 35 minutes on some procedural aspects. I, 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 I think uh, it is not time wasted, but we must be able to move on. Mr. Ogeto, uh, you are just beginning. And so the time will run from now, your two hours, it is 10 or 7. Proceed. Thank you very much, <clears throat> my lords, my ladies. Let me start, uh, my lords and my ladies, by saying that uh, it will be a miss of me not to say not to say how deeply honored I am this morning to appear before you on behalf of the Honorable the Attorney General. And before I proceed, my lords, my ladies, I know you had given us two hours to do our submissions and that applies to all the appellants. But I just want to point out to my lords and my ladies that uh, the team of His Excellency the President has very graciously donated 30 minutes, 30 extra minutes to us. And that is uh, the result of the fact that uh, we cover much more ground in terms of our grounds of appeal. And so, my lords, I just want to notify the court that uh, instead of the two hours, we also have 30 minutes from His Excellency, the President, for us to be able to be helpful to the court. Well, that's what we said in our direction. As long as the issues that you're covering are cross-cutting and those who are coming after you will not be required to take an equal amount of time on the same issues, it, 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 it is okay, as long as you have organized yourselves. So thank you very much, my lord and my lords and my ladies. My lords, we have filed 31 grounds of appeal, and those grounds will be found at uh, page one of our volume one of our record of appeal. But we propose, my lords, to argue those grounds in the form of thematic areas. And allow me, my lords, to outline those thematic areas and to place our appeal in proper context. The how, first... How many are the thematic areas? The thematic areas, my lord, are... nine thematic areas. The first thematic area is the applicability of the basic structure doctrine and that will cover grounds one to five, 17 and 18. The second thematic area will be the constitutional remit of popular initiative and the question of public participation, ground 7 to 17. The third thematic area, my lords, my ladies, the creation of additional constituencies, ground 24. The question 
of presidential immunity, the fourth them thematic area. That will cover grounds 19 to 23. The fifth thematic area, the quorum of the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, grounds 25 and 26. The sixth thematic area, adequacy of legal infrastructure to support signature verification, grounds 27 to 29. Yes. The seventh thematic area is the single or multiple referendum questions. Ground 31, the issue of voter registration as relates to holding of a referendum will be the next one. And finally, and that will cover ground 30. And yes. finally, the question of the role of Amicus Curiae, ground six. All right, start with the number one, the applicability of basic structure doctrine. Well, Lord, the way we want to do that is that uh, my colleagues will handle each of those thematic areas. Right. But for me, I want to give you highlights of uh, the essential aspects of our appeal. Then I'll let my colleagues deal with the specific aspects of these thematic areas. In other words, I just want to do an opening statement, my lords. My lords, let me start by stating at the outset that our appeal is nothing more than a plea to this honorable court for fidelity to our constitution. It is simply a call to this honorable court for the restoration of the people's sovereign will. Through our appeal, my late, my lords, we invite this honorable court to affirm the constitution as enacted by the people of this great republic. We also invite this Honorable Court to affirm that it is not for this court or for any other court to rewrite our Constitution. My lords, my ladies, our submissions will seek to demonstrate, among other issues, that one, the learned judges of the High Court disregarded clear provisions of the Constitution in order to arrive at their decision. But two, the learned judges effectively amended the Constitution. Number three, the learned judges of the High Court disregarded decision made by their colleagues in the High Court, in the Court of Appeal, and indeed the Supreme Court, and for the learned judges disenfranchised millions of Kenyan voters by ignoring their popular initiative. We will be submitting that the judges this, did this through personalized attacks against His Excellency the President of the Republic of Kenya that climaxed in factually and legally unfounded conclusions. An example of this, my lords, my ladies, is the unprecedented finding that a president can be sued in a personal capacity for official acts. On the disregard of the Constitution, my lords, my ladies, we will demonstrate that our Constitution has no place for the application of the basic structure doctrine. Chapter 16 of our Constitution, my lords, my ladies. That's right. 
Can you just repeat? The plane was passing by making noise. Just repeat. Sorry, my lady. Just repeat what you are saying before you come to what you want to start on now. The early, my earlier submission, my lady. No, no, uh, her ladyship is saying that uh, there was uh, loud noise from uh, a passing helicopter. And she requests that uh, you repeat what you just said in the last statement. I think about uh, the basic structure. After the personal attack to the president. Okay. On the disregard of the constitution, my lords, my ladies, we will demonstrate. I, I, th I think Mr. Ogeto, the last thing you addressed before the plane took your voice away was something about the constitution having no place for something, for the basic structure, I think. Yes. That's what you need to repeat for, for yes. us to get it right. Yes, and uh, what I'm saying in our submissions, my lords, my ladies, is that our constitution has no place for the application of the basic structure doctrine. Chapter 16 of our Constitution, my lords and my ladies, provides that our Constitution may be amended either through parliamentary initiative or popular initiative. The chapter confirms that all the provisions of our Constitution are amendable. Articles 255 and 257 in chapter 16, direct us in very clear detail how the Constitution may be amended. The provisions, my lords, my ladies, tell us which amendments require a referendum and those that do not require a referendum. The provisions prescribe the majorities required in either House of Parliament to pass an amendment. They also guide us on the majorities required to pass an amendment in a referendum. We submit, my lords, my ladies, that there is no limitation to this amendment power. Our constitution, in other words, is self-contained. There is no room for drawing inferences on the rules of amending the Constitution or for relying on extraneous factors. There is no mention in our Constitution of unamendable or eternal clauses in our Constitution. The United Judges themselves admitted as much in paragraph 473 of their judgment when they noted, and I quote, to be sure, there is no clause in the Constitution that explicitly makes any article in the Constitution unamendable. End of quote. Yet, my lords, my ladies, the learned judges proceeded to conclude that the basic structure doctrine was applicable in Kenya. To be clear, my lords and my ladies, Many of the democracies desiring to make their constitutions unamendable have done so explicitly. And we have examples which we have articulated in our submissions. Germany, Italy, France, Senegal, Gabon, and Morocco. We shall submit, my lords, my ladies, that courts have adopted the basic structure doctrine where amendments are exclusively by parliament. We do not have a single decision globally where courts have declared that the basic structure doctrine applies in a situation of a referendum. Perhaps, Mr. Ogeto, when uh, you get to the meat of that, you might want to uh, address the issue of Colombia when you get to the meat later on. We will do that. And in Colombia, what they've done, my lords, because we have looked at that constitution, is that where the intention of the makers of the constitution 
intended that you have a constituent assembly, they provided for it expressly in their constitution. We shall demonstrate that the people of Kenya consciously and deliberately avoided the basic structure doctrine. They chose a different method of safeguarding the fundamental provisions of their constitution. This method is what is laid down in chapter 16. Once this method has been followed, the people of Kenya can amend any provision in their constitution. Chapter 16, my lords, my ladies, was our balance between hyper amendment, which was the concern of the High Court, on the one hand, and rigidity on the other hand. And we invite my lords and my ladies to look at the final report of the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission 2005. This report, my lords, emphasized the need for this important balance at page 74 of that report. And we yeah. have reproduced that report. Yeah, where is it contained in the record of appeal, please? It is contained at page 12 of the amended case digest and pages 49 to 51 of the appellant's abridged bundle of authorities. And if you allow me, my lords, my ladies, just to quote briefly from this report, the quote, what they say, there is need to protect the Constitution against indiscriminate amendments. If the amendment procedure is too rigid, it may encourage revolutionary measures to bring about change instead of using the acceptable constitutional means. Thus, and that is important, my lords, a balance must be struck between these two extremes. At page 75 of the report, the commission proceeds as follows, and I quote, many Kenyans expressed fears that even after a comprehensive review of the constitution, Parliament, and the emphasis on Parliament, Parliament may thereafter sit and make substantial amendments that would water down all their efforts. In addition, it was generally felt that the current provision for amending the Constitution was too simple and therefore been used to consolidate power in the executive. The people, therefore, wanted fairly rigid arrangement, the amendment of which would require their participation in some form. This is what the CKRC report says. On this basis, my lords, my ladies, at page 76 of that report, there was a recommendation for a distinction in the amendment procedures for entrenched provisions and non-entrenched provisions. And my lords, my ladies, this distinction in the CKRC report is exactly what is reflected in chapter 16 of our constitution. This chapter captures the people's concerns and aspirations with regard to the power to amend the constitution. We submit that it balances between rigidity and amendability. There was never an intention to make certain parts of our constitution unamendable, because if that was the case, then the makers of our constitution would have expressly stated so in the constitution. My lords and my ladies, we shall demonstrate that in practice, chapter 16 has been very successful in safeguarding the constitution against the culture of hyper amendment. You will notice, and we have demonstrated that in our submissions, that since the promulgation of the constitution, 
there have been approximately 22 failed attempts to amend it. Two through popular initiative and 20 through parliamentary initiative. And we have detailed those in Schedule 2 to our submissions dated 8th of June 2021. On the second issue, my lords, my ladies, we shall show that the learned judges effectively purported to amend the Constitution under the guise of interpretation. In paragraph 474G of the judgment, the learned judges say that the purportedly unamendable and eternity clauses would be determined by the courts on a case-to-case -case basis. My lords, my ladies, we need to note this very carefully. And if this understanding is to hold, the courts would have the role of vetting proposed amendments before the same are dealt with in accordance with chapter 16. And yet, my lords and my ladies, there is no such role for the courts in our constitution. In paragraph 615 of the judgment, the learned judges held that each of the proposed amendment clauses ought to be presented as a separate referendum question. We submit and we will provide details in our submissions that this holding clearly contradicts articles 257 10 of the Constitution, which identifies in very clear terms that an, am an amendment bill as the subject matter of a referendum. In paragraph 546 of the judgment, the learned judges impose limitations on presidential immunity. This, again, we submit, my lords, my ladies, contradicts Article 143 of the Constitution, which gives a serving president absolute immunity from civil proceedings while exercising his official functions. On the third matter, my ladies and my lords, we shall show that the learned judges ignored court decisions from their own high court the Court of Appeal, and even the Supreme Court. In this regard, we shall point out the following. One, the learned judges ignored decisions to the effect that Chapter 16 <coughs> provides adequate means for amending the Constitution. And two, just as uh, illustration, the learned judges ignored a finding by the High Court that the IEBC has currently constituted a quorum. In paragraph 491 of the judgment, the learned judges claimed that the popular initiative mechanism is exclusively available to the private citizen, as opposed to a, to a state organ, or His Excellency, the President, or more generally, the government. My ladies and my lords, we shall show that the learned judges established a non-existent dichotomy in the use of the popular initiative. And by this, the learned judges disenfranchised nearly four million registered voters under the pretext of nullifying alleged unconstitutional acts by His Excellency the President. Our very humble view and with utmost respect, my lords and my ladies, is that the essence of a popular initiative is that it has to be popular by satisfying the majorities stipulated in the Constitution and nothing more. The initiative only becomes an initiative upon obtaining 
the endorsement of at least one million registered voters. The Constitution is very clear. It does not provide for the origin of a proposal to amend the Constitution through popular initiative. There is also no basis, my lords, my ladies, for the claim that the popular initiatives are by definition anti-government, because this was the finding of the Superior Court. And you will notice, my lords, my ladies, that this regrettable claim resulted partly from the learned judge's reliance on Wikipedia. They resorted to Wikipedia as an authority. And for sure, Wikipedia cannot be a reliable authority for anything serious, my lords, my ladies. If you look at Wikipedia, if you do a Google search of Wikipedia, it describes itself, and I quote, the free encyclopedia that anyone can edit, end of quote. So therefore, my lords, my ladies, a source that is so open to manipulation cannot be a reliable source of legal authority. In paragraph 490 of the judgment, the learned judges held that the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020 is an initiative of His Excellency the President. My lords and my ladies, this was a fundamental factual error on the part of the judges. To be clear, we will be submitting that nothing in the Constitution prevents His Excellency the President from originating an amendment proposal to the Constitution. Even so, in the present case, my Lord and my ladies, His Excellency the President never played the role that the learned judges claimed that he did. The learned judges simply ignored the evidence that was adduced as to who the promoters of the amendment bill were. And with utmost respect, my lords and my ladies, it seems to us that the learned judges were keen on very personalized attacks against the person of His Excellency the President. To them, the facts and the law did not matter. Neither did precedent nor the sovereign will of the people of the Republic of Kenya. The person of His Excellency the President just had to be found at fault, regardless of the consequences of such a finding on the people of Kenya and their sovereign power. In sum, my ladies and my lords, we will demonstrate that the learned judge's verdict was only possible because they either ignored or amended the Constitution and the law. At the end, the judges elevated their personal opinions and preferences over the Constitution and over the will of the people of this great republic. And therefore, my lords and my ladies, our plea to this honorable court is that it reverses the extra constitutional and anti-constitutional step taken by the High Court. We urge the court to affirm the letter and the spirit of our constitution. My lords and my ladies, we humbly invite you to end this clear on song, and we call it on song, in a very considered manner, on the sovereignty of the people of Kenya. We submit that the people must retain their sacrosanct right to live by their constitution that they chose for themselves and to develop it as they may wish. That is the only way to preserve a rule-based civilization. And I wish to quote the famous Irish philosopher Edmund Burke, who has warned us, and I quote, a state without the means of some change is without the means of its conservation, end of quote. 
My lords and my ladies, as I conclude, and with your kind permission, I should like to indicate that my learned colleagues will address the various topics of our submissions in the following order. Mr. George Raro, Senior Counsel, who is leading us, will address the question of the applicability of the Basic Structure Doctrine, public participation, and the approach to referendum questions. Mr. Kamau Karori will address the question of the remit of popular initiative and the creation of additional constituencies and the quorum of the IEBC. He will also deal with the question of Amica's Curie. With your permission, I will return to address you on the question of presidential immunity. My learned friend, Mr. Nyamodi, with your permission, will be replying to the respondents' submissions. Thank you very much, my lords. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Ogeto, for that uh, introduction of the issues that are going to be dealt with and the order in which uh, uh, council you're appearing with will address the issues. Uh, what we intend to do is uh, to take a short break now. Uh, we craft a short ruling. And when we come, we now begin with the senior council, Mr. Oraro, and then we continue with the others who are addressing the thematic uh, areas. Thank you, my lord. Uh, yes. I'm, 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 I'm obliged. All right. So we'll be back after about 30 minutes. All right, so right there is uh, the Court of Appeal, the appellate judges, the seven judge bench uh, taking a short break so that they can come back. But I just needed to give you a breakdown of what has transpired in the court uh, proceedings that started at exactly 9 a.m. Two crucial rulings that the seven judge bench are expected to make uh, this morning, and that is uh, striking out two affidavits um, uh, responses that have been given by the IEBC and also uh, by uh, the BBI team. And for the IEBC, um, uh, the um, Thika Linturi team wants uh, the court to strike out the evidence that has been given by the IBC in responding to their affidavit. Remember the Mithika Linturi, Senator Mithika Linturi, uh, actually um, uh, Senator, um, uh, the team actually of the respondents had given um, an, uh, uh, that's filed the application of the JLAC report uh, that was tabled at the National Assembly and also at the Senate and the IEBC gave a response by producing an affidavit um, uh, that they had given that has to do with the Gazette notice of the, regi the continuous registration by the, by the team of uh, the respondents say that that is introducing a new evidence. IEBC has never had a continuous voter registration exercise. The only registration exercise they had uh, was back in 2018 before the Kibra by-election. After that, they've never had any uh, vote, continuous voter registration exercise by the IEBC through their legal team. 
I say that that is not a new evidence. In fact, part of their appeal case before the appellate court is to have uh, their case had, uh, you know, to produce evidence and argue their case that indeed they have been having a continuous voter registration exercise on the part of uh, the BBI team that is represented by senior counsel James Orengo and also Otiende Amolo uh, say that the evidence uh, that has been uh, taken to the court by the respondents when it comes to the JLAC report that they took to the court for hearing does, is not a complete report and that uh, that is the reason as to why they want the Dennis Waweru um, affidavit that he sworn be considered and so the, that is one of the ruling that the judge is the seven judge bench is supposed to be giving when they come back after the short break they've taken they will make a decision as to whether to strike out the two affidavits responses that have been has been given by the IEBC and also by the BBI um, team and that BBI team affidavit respond uh, response has been sworn by Dennis Waweru one of the BBI um, uh, lead member who was uh, in that process of collection of uh, signatures now the other thing that they're supposed to be making a ruling is on uh, uh, the law on uh, Kanjama's um, uh, request by the court which he wants uh, to know to know the court's statement actually stand on who can participate on the issue on that issue of the ongoing case of the BBI appellate case because it says but as of yesterday uh, a ruling was given to allow two Amikai Kuriai to be allowed to participate in that case so he wants the judges to give a ruling as to whether other people who are not uh, part of that case from the beginning can be allowed to join the BBI appeal case that, uh, that is at the Court of Appeal. And definitely that is something that the judges have said they'll be giving a ruling. But of course, remember that a lawyer Kanjama has been barred from participating in that case. However, he is still part of that case based on uh, some of the things he wants to argue out before the judges. Now, before the judges took a short commercial break, they were also handling the issue. Um, they gave now the, solic the solicitor general um, that is Ogeto who is representing the office of the attorney general and was he has actually given down the 31 grounds of appeal that they want to argue out on the case one of them is that he says that the high court the five judge bench that gave their ruling that cannot rewrite the constitution of the country if father went ahead to say that the judges um, uh, disenfranchised millions of Kenyans who appended their signature on a, that BBI um, uh when there were signatures were being collected, it's saying that the high court, the judge, the five judge bench actually disenfranchised, disenfranchised millions of Kenyans by ignoring their popular initiative when they gave that ruling that the BBI process is null, unconstitutional, and cannot go ahead. It further goes ahead to say that some of the pronouncements, the ruling that was given by the judges, were personal, what he has termed as personal attacks to the president and that is something that they'll be arguing out before the judges when they come back and also he says that a parliamentary niche uh, definitely when one wants to change a constitution it is in the constitution public knowledge that the changing of the constitution can either be through a parliamentary or a popular initiative when one wants to amend the constitution and that's in connection with what the judges had said the constitutional court the high court when they gave their ruling that the president does not have any right to start an, an initiative of actually the president cannot start an initiative of amending the constitution so that is one of the other reasons as to they gave that they gave when they were saying that uh, this whole um, process of amending the constitution is null and void so two critical rulings just to remind you that are supposed uh, to be um, actually uh, given and uh, that has to do with the two affidavits as evidence uh, the two affidavits that has been given by the BBI team and also by the IEBC in response to an affidavit that has been uh, given that has actually been tabled at the court by one of the respondents uh, who has actually tabled the JLAC report the JLAC report uh, that was tabled at uh, the floor of the National Assembly and also at the Senate and uh, uh, the BBI team has
has said that the, um, you know, the JLAC report that has been tabled before the court as a part of uh, the argument that will be used by one of the respondents is not a complete report. And they're not trying to introduce any evidence, evidence as argued by one of the respondents. And also the other um, uh, ruling that the, judge, the judges have to give is whether to also strike out IEBC's um, response to that of JLAC uh, report affidavit that um, they've actually given out um, their Gazette notice saying that they have been doing a continuous regi voter registration exercise. But the respondent says that these two affidavits as responses that have been given by the team IEBC, team DBI uh, team, uh, is just as a way of trying to introduce new evidence and the court should not allow that. And the other ruling they're supposed to give is on lawyer Kanjama's request. The, he wants the judges to make it clear as to whether uh, people who are not party to this case from the beginning when it began at the High Court and also when it went to the Court of Appeal can be allowed to be part of that team. Remember, so far, two um, senior lecturers, law lecturers of the university have been allowed to be part of the court proceeding, but just as amicus curiae, meaning friends of the court. So that is something that lawyer Kanjama wants to be made very clear. And lastly, we had with Zomi Thiankuli, one of the lawyers for the appellate um, for the respondents who was also saying that the argument by the IEBC to introduce their Gazette notice of 2018 should be struck out because the last time, his argument before the seven judge bench, is that the last time IEBC did a, a, a continuous voter registration was back in 2018 before the Kibra by election and after that they've never had any continuous voter registration and so by the IEBC uh, pleaded with the judges telling them, you know what that is uh, something thing uh, that uh, we want to argue out before the case that as much as there is an argument that we never had uh, we've not had a continuous voter registration we want to prove to the seven judge bench that our evidence has to be taken that we've indeed been doing a voter con uh, a continuous voter registration exercise apart from the one that was conducted back in 2018 before the kibra by election bringing us to the end of ktn news center however it is not the end of uh, that continuous the continuing hearing of the BBI appeal case at uh, the Court of Appeal. That hearing is actually happening at the Court of Appeal and all legal minds are there to argue out their case. You know, the legal mind that is representing Honorable Raila Odinga, uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta, a legal mind who's representing the Office of the Attorney General, the IEBC, and also the respondents. And we've seen also within the respondent team, we've seen the likes of uh, Honorable Martha Karua, and we've also seen um, uh, Nelson Harvey and his team. We've also seen Haminua, uh, senior counsel Haminua and his team also, and Muzomi Thiankuli representing the team of the respondents. It is such a, a heavy time, you know, for the judges just to try and listen keenly to what these legal minds are telling them. The hearings have begun today. It will end on Friday, the 2nd of uh, July, before they make that crucial ruling to tell Kenyans whether they will uphold the ruling of the High Court uh, of the five judge bench that said that process to um, amend the constitution is null and void or whether it will go towards the favor uh, of uh, the president and also his uh, um, uh, person that he always calls as his brother ODM party leader Raila Odinga so I leave you with that court proceeding that is about to come back because for uh, right now they've taken a short commercial break it is going to be a busy day here on KTN News as we try to give you the full uh, live coverage only the best way we can through our colleagues who are located at the Court of Appeal here in Nairobi. From me and the entire team here at KTN News Center and also my colleagues on the ground at the Court of Appeal who's ensure that we we'll give you the live coverage as to what is transpiring at the court when it began in the morning. I'd like to say Asante Sana. I see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. But then my colleagues are up next. Actually, on, uh, that should be happening on KTN Home. I was about to say you.